everyone, my name is Sydney Gladman, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer of the Material Innovation Initiative. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our recently published report on white space analysis and the next-gen materials industry. And in this report, we are going to talk about opportunities for innovation in the next-gen materials industry. First, let me tell you a little bit more about who we are at MII. The Material Innovation Initiative is a nonprofit that accelerates the development of high-performance, animal-free, more sustainable materials. We call these next-gen materials. We accelerate the development of next-gen materials. We do this by partnering with brands, scientists, startups, investors, and retailers in order to bring them to market. Our vision is a world where the materials we interact with every day are produced in a way that allows animals, the planet, and future generations to thrive. First, I will go over a few definitions that will help you better understand the landscape of the next-gen material space. First definition is animal-based materials, which we call the incumbents. These materials are leather, silk, wool, fur, down, and exotic skins, materials that have been employed by humans for centuries in the fashion industry. These animal-based materials have a lot of historic use but environmental and ethical challenges, which are urging us to find better replacements. The current generation replacements are synthetic materials. These are primarily petroleum-derived materials, such as polyurethane, polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, polyester, acrylic, and more. So while we got animals out of the equation with these current gen solutions, we still have a lot of sustainability issues to overcome. So in comes next gen materials. Here, we see a new crop of scientists, artists, and innovators that will pioneer high-performance, animal-free, more sustainable materials. These are the next generation of our material economy. So what do we mean when we talk about white spaces? In this report, we really mean white spaces to be untapped areas of innovation. They might be areas without current competition, but also new technology and gaps in existing markets. In the report, we found seven areas uh, of significant opportunities that we'll discuss in just a moment. Our goal with these identifying these white spaces is to direct interests, attention, and resources so that the entire next-gen industry can work together to accelerate the industry forward. One note we want to make is that most of these white spaces have something to do with sustainability. However, we want to caution that sustainability is a big challenge and it's impossible to have a perfectly sustainable material. Dr. Amanda Parks, the Chief Innovation Officer at Pangaea says it best. Sustainability is always a series of compromises based on priorities and we need a lot of people doing some things better rather than a few people doing everything perfectly. This goes with MII's motto of progress towards perfection. So first, let me tell you a little bit about these white spaces we're going to go into today. The first white space is that we have subcategories in the next-gen material space with limited innovation. Here, finding sustainable alternatives to silk, down, fur, wool, and exotic skins see few innovators compared to leather, where we see a majority of our innovators at this time. The next is, can we make 100% sustainable formulations? Here, we know that the resins, coatings, binders, dyes, and finishes, many of the components that go into a formulation for a next-gen material, are also of concern with sustainability. And therefore, finding bio-based versions of these materials could provide solutions. Our next white space is beyond polyester. Polyester is a ubiquitous and versatile material that finds itself in nearly every subcategory of the next-gen material space. Therefore, it would be a great advantage to continue to search for 100% bio-based synthetic fibers that can utilize the versatility and high performance of polyester, but improve upon its sustainability. In the same category of feedstock, uh, feedstock options, we also have biofeedstock to consider. Here, biodiscovery and processing innovation for natural and cellulosic fibers and materials is an attractive space for innovators and next-gen materials. Next, we think about getting versatile. And here, we're talking about having multiple pathways at the end of life in order to better manage our material cycles. The next white space is material science done right. Here, we should learn from biomimicry and bottom-up materials design to better design in the properties and performance factors that are needed to make a successful next-gen material. 
Finally, we talk about biotechnology scale-up challenges and each of the process steps that are necessary to perfect in order to get cellular agriculture at scale. So first, let's talk about our white space number one, subcategories with limited innovation. Here, we see silk, down, fur, wool, and exotic skins that are in need of continued innovation. To remind you, we have six categories, leather, silk, wool, down, fur, and exotic skins, and from our recent analysis in the State of the Industry report published in June 2021, you can see that the next-gen material landscape leans heavily in the leather sector. We see 49 companies innovating in next-gen leather, with less than 10 in each of the other categories. More than two-thirds of all of the companies, as according to this June 2021 landscape, are in leather. And we need to have more people in these valuable other subcategories. And what do I need by valuable? What's really interesting about some of these materials, such as silk, is that they're incredibly valuable materials. Silk is $55 a kilogram for yarn. Whereas if you compare that to something like polyester, our ubiquitous material that encompasses half of all of the textiles we use today, it's only at $1 a kilogram. If you're an innovator producing new materials from scratch, you can see how daunting it would be to meet price parity for something at $1 a kilogram. Whereas meeting something at about five to fifty-five dollars a kilogram could be much more attractive, be closer to get to price parity. The other advantage is that silk has a relatively lower volume compared to polyester. This makes it so that if you are a pilot stage innovator, even small amounts of material that you can produce might be able to make a big impact in disrupting the incumbent industry. So let's move on to our next white space, white space number two. How do we get to 100% sustainable? And here we're talking about bio-based resins, coatings, binders, dyes, and finishes. Many may have been hearing about some of the challenges that have come with making next-gen leather more sustainable. Polyurethane and polyvinyl chloride are really common materials employed in the current gen and even in our next-gen material space. And we really are still struggling to find perfectly eco-friendly substitutes that don't involve animals and don't involve petroleum. Some of the spaces where we see this are in polyurethane, like I mentioned, and other coatings and binders. Here, bio-based or petrochemical-free resins would reduce the reliance on fossil fuels and reduce the environmental impact of these materials, while still allowing for the high performance enhancing properties of such coatings and binders. On the other hand, we also have components such as dyes, additives, and finishes. Here, these components that provide performance features such as color, moisture management, or softness can also be associated with sustainability or safety concerns. Again, low impact alternatives such as bio-based components may make for more holistically sustainable next-gen materials. And therefore, when you're an innovator in this space, you should be thinking about the whole formulation and not just the underlying base material from which you are innovating. Moving on to our next white space, number three, beyond polyester. Here, we're talking about how innovation in bio-based synthetic fibers could make a big impact in this space. So why are we talking about polyester? Polyester is an extremely versatile material. It's actually found its way into nearly every subcategory of next-gen material space. Polyester satin can mimic silk. Polyester fleece can mimic wool and shearling. Non-woven polyester can be used as insulation and a down alternative. You see polyester used in suede and leather and fibers used in faux fur. Really, it grows across every material category. However, as we are aware, polyester and other synthetic fibers are derived from fossil fuels and associated with microplastic pollution and poor end of life management. So what can we do to improve? Here we can look at biosynthetics. Biosynthetics are behave similar to the plastic-based materials like polyester, but are derived from bio-based ingredients. You can see here that some of them are also biodegradable. At the top, we're showing naturally occurring polymers like cellulose, chitin, and proteins that are ubiquitously biodegradable in very many different end-of-life pathways. Excitingly, we're starting to see a few bio biosynthetics as shown below that also have some of these biodegradation pathways. And next-gen innovators may be able to employ these feedstocks as sustainable replacements to the traditional fossil-derived synthetics in order to 
reduce their environmental footprint. Next, we're going to talk about another form of feedstock, this time biofeedstock. Here, we're talking about biodiscovery and processing innovation for natural and cellulosic fibers and materials in white space number four. Similar to polyester, these plant matter-based feedstocks are very versatile and find themselves in many categories in the next-gen material space. However, just because they're derived from plants and not petroleum doesn't mean we've solved all of our concerns for sustainability. Both of these material sets, both the cellulosic, semi-synthetic fibers, and the natural fibers and materials might be derived from agricultural sources or forests and then lead to issues with environmental issues such as agricultural, chemical use, land use, water use, deforestation. However, in both of these categories, agricultural waste might be an interesting solution to provide more sustainable feedstocks for these types of materials. Interestingly, a recent report commissioned by the Laudes Foundation identified some feasible, uh, available agricultural waste streams that might be employed in both cellulosic fibers, these are the bars shown in red in the chart, as well as for natural fibers, the ones shown in blue in the chart. As you can see, we have over a billion tons of agricultural residues that might be able to be used, and we don't have to rely on things like virgin trees to make our materials. Next-gen innovators can then employ these feedstocks to reduce their reliance on those virgin agricultural products and reduce their environmental impact. Our next white space, number five, let's get versatile. Here we're talking about the end of life for materials, and this is really big challenge across the board in the textile industry, but it is not something that the next gen industry is able to avoid. So here we're talking about multiple pathways at the end of life. Why are we talking about end of life when we're talking about raw material choices? Well, a lot of people think that your raw material really just impacts the beginning of life sustainability, but in fact, it also has a big impact on your end of life. The material you choose ends up pre-selecting where your material can go at the end of its life. And here's the big challenge. These are stats for the entire textile industry. 73% of all of our clothing is landfilled or incinerated. 30% of our microplastic pollution that we've identified to date is estimated to derive directly from textiles. And sadly, only 1% of all of our textiles are recycled. This shows us that we have a long way to go in managing the end of life for textiles. Even more so, the average consumer only wears an item of clothing less than 10 times, so that end of life comes sooner than you think. Overall, an estimated $100 billion of textiles are presumed to be lost each year due to this poor end of life management. So what can we do to improve? The answer that many have decided is let's make our materials more circular. And in that way, we can continue to reuse the same material streams in a closed loop fashion. In particular for next gen materials, what could be interesting is to consider versatile strategies. That means having multiple options for your end of life to reduce the burden on the consumer to make the right choice at the end of its life. This may mean making sure that your materials are able to be reused, repaired, recycled, and biodegradable all at the same time. And in this way, we hope to eliminate the use of incineration, landfill, or uncontrolled environmental degradation while reducing our use of irresponsibly sourced agricultural biomass as well as natural unrenewable resources such as petroleum. Our next white space, number six, is material science done right. Here we're talking about bottom-up materials design. And what do I mean by bottom-up materials design? Here I'm showing a schematic of a wool fiber going all the way down to its smallest length scale, which is a single protein chain, all the way up to the whole cuticle hair that you see in wool. As you can see, as you traverse the length scales across from a single nanometer all the way up to the macro scale, there are lots of different structures and complex compositions that go into producing a wool fiber. And this is really at the heart of what bottom-up materials design is, is understanding how this complex structure property relationship makes wool behave the way it does. And this can be said for all of our next-gen materials that are reliant on complex hierarchical structures like you see here. So what do we mean by better materials science? This is really the basics of material science. This is called the structure property relationships. 
Here, what we need to do is understand the performance we want out of material. Understand how performance translates to specific material properties. These are measurable properties like strength or thermal properties. Then go further to understand what about the composition and structure of these materials is necessary to achieve the desired property set. Further, we need to explore how processing plays a role. Structure needs to be achieved through processing and structure can evolve in service impacting the durability or the component life. And all of this kind of cycles together in an iterative way to understand how materials function and behave. Next gen innovators should employ this bottom up material design using biomimicry to recapitulate the aesthetics and performance of incumbent and animal derived materials by trying to replicate as much as possible this composition structure processing properties relationship. Our last white space is white space number seven, biotechnology scale up. And here we're talking about cellular agriculture at scale and the common steps that need to be taken by all of these different approaches to achieve scale up. And what do I mean by cellular agriculture? Cellular agriculture is the method of taking living organisms and growing them to produce a desired product, in this case, materials. In the next-gen material space, we see people using mycelium, which is the root-like structure of mushrooms to create leather. We see people actually growing animal cells in the laboratory to create real sheets of leather. We also see people using microbes as factories to produce either non-native protein molecules like animal-derived proteins such as silk or collagen, or native molecules such as cellulose that can then be used in the formulation to create next-gen materials. The one thing that all of these materials have in common is that there are multiple challenging steps that need to be perfected in order to scale up these materials. The first is the organism. We need to identify and engineer the specific species and strain of that organism, of those cells, that's going to produce the material or component. Next, we need to select and deliver the nutrients that are going to support the living organism while it grows. In the growth process, we need to optimize the process conditions and the equipment that are going to support the growth of the organism. And then we need to work on the harvest and conversion process. Here, collection, purification, and transformation of the organism is a very critical step. For example, producing a silk protein is not the end game. We actually need to produce a silk fiber. And there is a lot of work that goes in producing something that goes from a protein to a functional high-performance fiber. Lastly, scale up. We need to overcome commercialization challenges in order to get these materials to be produced at scale. That's at large volumes in order to achieve reasonable costs that a consumer can buy these products. So one of the things that is unique to the biotech industry and people employing this technology is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to be successful. The typical journey here as shown by the Mills Fabrica and Bolt Thread SynBio playbook is about 10 years from founding the company to exit. And that can be over $100 million in funding in order to be successful. So you can see there are multiple different steps of growth and funding that need to be achieved before these materials can come to market. So one of the things we need to understand is that we need a little bit of patience when we're dealing with biotech. Lastly, I'll talk about our bonus section. This was a, a collaboration with the Mills Fabrica team in learning from the alt protein industry. So the alternative protein industry or replacements to meat, cheese, dairy, and other materials actually has a lot of overlaps with the next gen material space. Both of them are trying to remove animals from the equation and actually doing so with very similar technology spaces. You can see that in both food and fashion, we have companies that are pulling precision fermentation or taking microbes and using them as factories to produce proteins and molecules. We have tissue engineering approaches where we're growing actual animal cells to create either lab-grown meat or lab-grown leather. And then mycelial growth, as I had mentioned, this root-like structure of mushrooms is versatile both as a food ingredient and as a material. So as we can see, there's a lot of overlap in what is happening, and there's a lot we can learn from what happened in the alt protein movement, which is a little bit ahead of the next gen material space. One of the things we're seeing is that we think that the growth rate of the next gen material space is going to match what we already saw in the past with the alternative protein space. And here we see that there's a projected growth that by 2026, about five years from now, we expect for the next gen materials industry to have a market size of about $2 billion. So we think there's going to be a really exponential growth 
to bring this market up to scale. So we hope that these white spaces seem interesting to you and that you will take a deeper dive in our report available on our website at materialinnovation.org. There you will find other reports that are freely available, including scientific reports like what makes silk silk and a technology assessment on mycelium leather, as well as more industry reports like the state of the industry report and consumer research reports. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation and that you will take a look at all of our reports and resources available at materialinnovation.org. Thank you.